Bonjour, mes amis. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am here with my wonderful colleagues, my beloved colleague of long standing, Diane Le Boutillier, and our fabulous new colleague, Anita Anant. And we are delighted to answer your questions. Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Minister Freeland, do you still have um, the same clout and power that you did as Foreign Affairs Minister? You don't have a, a big department anymore. What power, what role will you actually play in this new government? Well, I think the Prime Minister expressed it very well when he said that today, well, he said a couple of things. He pointed out that probably, certainly one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge that our government faced in the last mandate was the NAFTA negotiation and the negotiation around the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. That is really an effort which I believe was a truly national effort, an effort of our whole country, led by the Prime Minister and me. And it was an experience where we learned how well we can work together in addressing the big challenges our country faces. Today I think Canadians appreciate that we face some big challenges at home. Uh, notably the challenge around being sure that we can act united as a country. United as a country facing the big threats in the world today. United as a country facing the existential challenge of climate change. United as a country facing the challenge of being sure Canadians have great jobs and a strong social welfare net. Challenge around issues like pharmacare. And these big challenges that we're facing today in 2019, very, very many of them require a, an effective relationship between the provinces and the federal government. And that is going to be an area I'm going to focus on in my work as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, working with the Prime Minister. I will continue to have responsibility for the NAFTA negotiation and broadly oversee the Canada-U.S. relationship because that is so central when it comes to our country's place in the world. At the end of the day, though, this is really going to be about working closely with the Prime Minister and working closely with my fantastic Cabinet colleagues. Le Premier ministre a déjà expliqué que uh, pendant uh, le mandat qui a commencé en 2015, uh, une des défis uh, les plus importants et les plus difficiles était les négociations autour de Alena et les négociations autour des tarifs de 132. Uh, pendant ces négociations, on a découvert, moi et le Premier ministre, que on travaille très bien ensemble, que on est une bonne équipe. Et on a découvert aussi que ensemble on peut unir tout le pays. Aujourd'hui, en 2019, je pense que les Canadiens comprennent que nos défis les plus importants sont plus domestiques. C'est un moment quand on doit travailler pour être un pays uni et un pays qui peut travailler en manière unie à en confronter les plus grands défis de ce moment. Les défis comme les changements climatiques, les défis comme euh, une économie forte pour la classe moyenne, les défis comme euh, Pharmacare, qui est une des promesses dans notre mandat. Et je veux aussi souligner que, euh, ayant dire que les négociations sur Alena sont très importantes, euh, c'est important pour moi et pour le Premier ministre que je continuerai d'être la ministre responsable pour ces négociations et en général pour nos relations avec les États-Unis qui sont si importants pour notre pays. Prime Minister Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Uh, you're wearing a lot of hats in the new cabinet. You're deputy prime minister. You're in charge of <laughs> in charge of Canada, U.S., and you're also intergovernmental. On the intergovernmental file, how are you going to reassure the West that when you have so many different things that you're doing in cabinet, that that is your number one focus?
The real challenge today, I think, for our country is for our country to understand that we are facing such big issues in the world today that we really have to face them as Team Canada. And I must say, you know, drawing on my experience as foreign minister, I learned two really important things. Uh, one thing is, and I think sometimes you have to have a bit of a distance to fully appreciate this, um, how fantastic our country is, how lucky we are to be Canadian, that Canada really is the strongest liberal democracy in the world. But at the same time, being foreign minister helped me to see what a challenging time we live in today. I think this is one of the most challenging environments for liberal democracies that we have experienced since World War II. And that includes our own country. And as the, the Prime Minister referred to the NAFTA negotiations, which were a real learning experience, I think, for all of us. And the strongest learning we came out of from the NAFTA negotiation was you have to face the big challenges united as a country. And that is what we need to do when it comes to confronting the big issues of our time. When it comes to the West specifically, I think what we need to do as a federal government when it comes to the West and when it comes to all our provincial relationships is really listen hard. With the NAFTA negotiations, what journalists tended to see was the negotiation itself and Canada talking to the U.S., talking to Mexico. But that was like the tip of the iceberg. 90% of the iceberg was working very, very closely with stakeholders across the country and understanding from them what they need and what they want. And I think the challenge right now in intergovernmental relations is to start by listening very, very hard, listening to Canadians. You're right to specify the West. As a government, we have a message. The election sent a message from the West to our party. And now is a moment when we need to respond to begin with by listening really, really hard and really effectively. Donald Trump uh, tweeted today that Canada is ready to flee from the NAFTA negotiations. Are we ready to flee? And are you con uh, confident with impeachment and other issues in the states that are going on now that we'll be able to ratify NAFTA in the U.S. before the presidential election in 2020? So I have been in Rideau Hall all day and haven't been checking social media. Um, so I'm not going to respond specifically to anything out there on social media. But let me say, when it comes to the NAFTA negotiations, I had a very good conversation with Chairman Richard Neal, the Democratic Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, who came here earlier this month with a congressional delegation to meet with the Prime Minister and then me and Patty Haidu. I spoke with him on Sunday, and he said that he and Speaker Pelosi are very committed to getting to yes, that they are working hard and are hopeful of reaching agreement with Ambassador Lighthizer, the USTR. Uh, and there have been meetings this week. I also spoke on Monday uh, with Ambassador Lighthizer, who gave me the same message. So, you know, there is hard work being done in the U.S. on its domestic ratification process. What we heard from Chairman Neal when he was here in Ottawa is that impeachment will not, for the, from the Democrat, from the Democratic point of view, what they are saying, and they've been very clear on this, is that they're committed to continuing to do other work, including work on NAFTA. We have to take them at their word, and we are certainly here working both with the Democrats and with Ambassador Lighthizer. Last question. Uh, Minister Freeland, do I... Do any questions for my friends? <laughs> no, we, we do, but we do, we're running out of time. Um, in terms of the impeachment inquiry, Donald Trump has defended himself by saying that the president of Ukraine uh, did not know that he was de delaying military aid to that government. You and the prime minister met with the president of Ukraine in the summer around the same time that are in question at the inquiry right now, did the president of Ukraine ever mention that the U.S. was delaying aid to his government? That is a question for the president of Ukraine, not for any Canadian government ministers. Thank you. Okay. Merci beaucoup tout le monde.
Christia Freeland, who is now the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, answering reporters' questions with two other members of the new cabinet at her side, Diane Le Boutelier, who is the Minister of National Revenue, and Anita Anand, who has uh, just been sworn into uh, the cabinet as the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. And we expect that uh, this is going to continue, this pattern of three ministers coming to the podium and answering reporters' questions over the course of the coming minutes and hours. Uh, that would mean that we'd have 12 different groups come to the podium because there are 36 members of the new cabinet. So we're not sure what the interval will be between each of those uh, uh, gatherings, but it looks like there's a, another group coming out right now. So uh, we'll zoom in a little bit here and see who the next group of cabinet ministers is. Uh, and in a few minutes, uh, we'll also just do a recap to let you know who some of the cabinet ministers are in key portfolios. But uh, it looks like we've got Melanie Jolie, uh, Jonathan Wilkinson, who is the new uh, environment minister, and Bartish Chagger. So let's go back to Rideau Hall. I'm wondering how you see, because uh, you're from BC, how you see your role, and I know you spent some time in Saskatchewan, how you see your role in reaching out to the West, and also how you see the government's environment plan uh, fitting in with the sediment that's in Alberta and Saskatchewan right now? Well, I think Canadians were pretty clear during the campaign that they want strong action on climate change. Um, and that is something that we certainly are endeavoring to do. As you probably know, I spent 15 years as a clean tech executive before I got into, uh, into politics in 2015. But I think what they also said is they want to make sure that we're being as thoughtful and, and as sensitive to the legitimate aspirations of all regions of the country. That certainly includes Alberta and Saskatchewan. I, uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan. I went to university in Saskatchewan. I worked for the Premier of Saskatchewan, a former Premier of Saskatchewan. I did intergovernmental affairs from the provincial side for the province of Saskatchewan. And so reaching out and having conversations with uh, stakeholders in that province and in Alberta um, is something that I see as an important part of the role in making sure that climate change is being addressed in substantive ways, but that we're doing so in a manner that, uh, that meets the concerns and the aspirations of all regions of this country. Oui, euh, je crois que tous les Canadiens pensent que euh, nous devons euh, euh, nous devons faire les choses pour euh, pour combattre le changement climatique. Mais euh, les Canadiens veulent que nous sommes euh, très euh, nous pensons très euh, très euh, fort de comment est-ce qu'on fait ça dans une manière qui euh, dans laquelle on peut avoir euh, la prospérité euh, économique. Et bien sûr, les provinces de Alberta et Saskatchewan sont très importantes. Nous devons avoir une conversation avec les stakeholders de les provinces qui produisent les, les, les hydrocarbones. Et donc, comment est-ce qu'on peut avoir une économie forte, mais aussi combattre le changement climatique? Et je crois que J'ai grandi à Saskatchewan et j'ai travaillé pour le premier ministre de Saskatchewan. J'ai fait les relations euh, provinciales euh, fédérales pour la province de Saskatchewan et je veux vraiment, je veux avoir euh, les bonnes discussions avec comment est-ce qu'on peut euh, travailler ensemble. Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Minister Wilkinson, um, your government in the last four years already alienated the West, already created many divisions between, or perceived divisions, between the West and between your government and its climate initiatives. But you need to do more and go further in order to meet your targets. So how can you do that? What will you change in order to somehow find a way to get them on board while you push further ahead? Yeah, with, with due respect, it, it is not a Western issue. Um, it, we, uh, the, the, the Liberal Party elected 11 members of Parliament in British Columbia and four members of party in, in, um, in Manitoba. The issue is one that relates very much to the hydrocarbon producing regions of this country and how uh, we address climate change in a way that addresses their legitimate economic concerns. That is something that I think we need to be thoughtful of. We have started the process of addressing climate change in substantive ways. We need to, we've started the process of trying to think through the, uh, the economics of how we actually move through this energy transition. But obviously we need to do more. Uh, as we move towards a plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, we need to be thoughtful about the economic pathways. My background is, uh, is energy technology and clean technology. That is certainly 
one very important part of that. It is an important part where I think there is much common ground with the hydrocarbon producing regions around how do we reduce emissions intensity? Are there ways to monetize the energy value of the hydrocarbons in a manner that is not carbon polluting? And those are areas where I think we can find common ground. Bonjour, Madame Jolie. Um, par rapport à votre nomination aujourd'hui, certains se demandent si c'est véritablement une promotion. Vous, comment vous acceptez cette nomination et vous voyez ça comme euh, du galon que vous gagnez aujourd'hui? Mais je suis très contente d'avoir eu la chance, euh, dans le cadre de, de mes fonctions au cours du premier mandat, euh, de pouvoir aller à la rencontre de personnes partout à travers le pays. Et ce que j'ai découvert, c'est que plusieurs personnes qui, ben, en fait, les Canadiens sont fiers de leur région, sont fiers de leur communauté. Et au même moment, mais il y a une préoccupation une tension qu'on peut voir entre les régions et les grands centres. Et une personne qui habite à Rouen, à Bathurst, devra avoir accès au même type d'emploi, un, em un bon emploi, comme une personne de Montréal ou Toronto. Et donc, pour notre gouvernement, la question du développement économique s'inscrit dans une volonté d'égalité des chances. Et c'est pour ça que le premier ministre m'a donné cette fonction, une nouvelle fonction, qui va être appuyée par six secrétaires parlementaires qui vont pouvoir, euh, peu à peu, donner une voix plus forte aux différentes régions du pays et en même temps pouvoir aborder, adresser les questions qui sont fondamentales dans les régions au pays, qui sont essentiellement l'accès à des bons emplois et avoir un, un filet social fort. Est-ce que vous voyez ça comme une promotion? Bien, j'ai eu l'occasion de parler avec le premier ministre à plusieurs reprises et euh, on a eu de bonnes conversations et, et l'idée est venue du fait de mon travail à tourisme. Et euh, ce que j'ai découvert à tourisme, c'est qu'on pouvait vraiment utiliser davantage le potentiel des agences de développement économique régional et c'est l'idée que je lui ai soumise euh, de pouvoir occuper ce poste-là et, et puis euh, ben, je pense que ça a été bien reçu et puis je suis contente de pouvoir continuer euh, ce travail-là euh, et de représenter le secteur du tourisme et aussi, je vais être très franche avec vous, euh, j'aurais été déçue de ne pas faire la modernisation de la loi sur les langues officielles. Ça fait quatre ans que je travaille sur cette question-là, une loi fondamentale pour notre pays. Le bilinguisme est un des concepts, un, une des, en fait, je dirais même euh, un des principes euh, de, qui, qui, qui fait partie de, de nos valeurs canadiennes. Et donc, euh, je suis contente de pouvoir justement procéder à cette modernisation-là et que le premier ministre m'ait fait confiance sur cette question. Hi, it's Annie Bergeron Oliver with CTV National News. My question is for Minister Chagger. You have a new portfolio, diversity. Oh, wait, that did not come out. <laughs> diversity, <laughs> inclusion, and youth. I'm wondering if you can provide some insight on exactly what the targets and the priorities are with this new portfolio. Well, as we know, in Canada, diversity is our strength, and this is. I believe an opportunity for us to really look at the best that every single Canadian has to offer, bringing out the best of all of our regions, bringing out the best of our country. So I look forward to receiving my mandate letter and advancing this portfolio. Um, for myself, what I think is exciting is that the Prime Minister recognizes the importance of diversity, the importance of inclusion, and the importance of recognizing that the youth are the second largest segment. It's a very important population, and that voice needs to be represented at the Cabinet table, and I will work my hardest to ensure that it is represented across all portfolios and that we work even better together to deliver for Canadians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bartis Chagger, Melanie Jolie, and Jonathan Wilkinson, three members of the newly sworn-in cabinet, speaking to reporters outside Rideau Hall. As the sun starts to go down, it gets a little darker. Uh, interesting to see all three of them being asked questions. Jonathan Wilkinson, of course, is the new Minister of Environment and Climate Change, so he uh, had uh, the, a number of questions about how he was going to handle that portfolio. Uh, I wanted to draw attention to what Christia Freeland, the new Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, alluded to when she was speaking just before that group about how she will retain some oversight of the negotiations regarding the new North American free trade deal between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and will broadly oversee Canada-U.S. relations as well. So here are three more ministers, Karina Gould, Lawrence McCauley, and Pablo Rodriguez, the government house leader. Let's go back to Rideau Hall. Monsieur Rodriguez, s'il vous plaît, allez au micro, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour, félicitations. Comment pensez-vous, comment comptez-vous accomplir votre rôle de leader en chambre alors que vous avez aussi un autre très gros mandat de lieutenant au Québec? Quel équilibre vous allez faire dans tout ça entre ces deux fonctions importantes? 
Ben, moi, je pense que les deux fonctions peuvent aller euh, de pair. Lorsque nous sommes en chambre, évidemment, euh, je me concentre sur les travaux de la chambre, sur les discussions, les négociations avec euh, l'ensemble des autres euh, parties. Mais dès que la chambre euh, cesse de siéger, ben moi, euh, je suis au Québec. Je suis au Québec. Je ne serai pas à, à Ontario. Je ne serai pas à Colombie-Britannique. Je vais être tout le temps au Québec. Donc, on a déjà le premier ministre qui est un Québécois qui est présent. Là, vous avez un autre Québécois euh, qui va passer tout son temps, euh, lorsque le Parlement ne siège pas, euh, à voyager à, à travers le Québec, à discuter, à avoir des rencontres. Et j'aurai aussi une équipe pour m'appuyer dans mes fonctions. Vous êtes euh, leader en chambre d'un gouvernement minoritaire. Comment, comment ça va influencer votre, votre, votre travail, votre rôle? Comment vous voyez ça? Bien, le, les Canadiens nous ont envoyé un message euh, très clair. Ils nous ont donné l'opportunité de gouverner, ce qui est un honneur, un privilège. Mais ils nous ont aussi dit, il faut que vous parliez, il faut que vous collaboriez entre vous. Et, et c'est ce qu'on va faire. Euh, vous savez, on est tous là pour améliorer la vie des gens. On, des fois, on voit les choses un peu différemment. Des fois, on les voit de la même, de la même façon également. Donc, euh, nos priorités, vous les connaissez. Toute la question de la lutte au changement climatique, la réduction de la pauvreté, le, le développement de l'économie. Euh, il y a certainement des façons de s'entendre avec un ou l'autre des parties pour, uh, pour arriver à avancer. Um, so, I mean, can, Canadians, uh, Canadians sent us uh, a clear message. They gave us the, the opportunity uh, to govern Canada, which is a, a privilege, an honor and a privilege. But they also said to us at the same time, we need you guys uh, to speak to each other a bit more, to collaborate uh, a bit more. And this is what we'll be doing. We, we have uh, stated our priorities very clearly, fight against climate change, uh, improving, uh, keep improving our economy, fighting poverty. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that we, we can find allies uh, depending on, on the subject, because we all have the same purpose, which is to improve our society. Mais en même temps, là-dessus, euh, M. Rodriguez, vous êtes euh, quelqu'un qui a parfois une, un tempérament bouillant. <laughs> euh, en contexte minoritaire, comment est-ce que vous comptez... Euh, le contrôler ou, 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 ou le, non, le, le calmer? Non, mais sérieusement, c est, c est, c est, comment est-ce que vous comptez avoir ces relations-là avec l'opposition tout en leur répliquant aux communes, sachant que des fois, parfois, vous pouvez être euh, énergique? Énergique, merci. Oui, hein? euh, écoutez, je, moi, je retiens trois mots euh, au lendemain de l'élection. C'est humilité, c'est de regarder ce siècle humilité. Euh, collaboration et écoute. Et ce sont trois éléments, trois mots que, euh, que je et, et, et l'ensemble de l'équipe, on va, on va appliquer. Et euh, ce qui est essentiel pour moi, c'est de pouvoir dégager des points communs avec, avec les autres parties. Et il y en a, il y en a beaucoup. Là. La question de l'environnement, euh, je peux facilement euh, voir des ententes avec certains partis sur la question de la lutte à la pauvreté euh, et ainsi de suite. Mais vous allez pouvoir euh, euh, voir un, un leader du gouvernement en chambre qui qui va être à la fois à l'écoute, avec une main tendue et une volonté euh, très sincère de collaborer avec les autres partis. Et euh, sur euh, votre rôle de lieutenant, vous dites, euh, ben, ben, quand ça ne siègera pas, je serai au Québec. Reste que la majorité du temps, vous allez devoir être en chambre, minorité oblige. Est-ce que c'est vraiment suffisant d'être lieutenant à temps partiel? Non, non, c'est lieutenant à temps plein. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que physiquement, pour faire le tour du Québec, ça serait la même chose pour n'importe quel ministre. D'ailleurs, dans un gouvernement minoritaire, l'absence de ministre est beaucoup plus rare. Euh, c'est beaucoup plus complexe. On je l'ai vécu à plusieurs reprises. C'est d'ailleurs mon quatrième gouvernement euh, minoritaire. Mais il euh, y a beaucoup de travail euh, de lieutenant qui peut se faire lorsque le Parlement siège. Ce que je dis, c'est que euh, la présence physique, évidemment, à travers les régions, se fera lorsque le Parlement ne siègera pas de façon générale. Mais j'aurai aussi une équipe euh, qui sera dévouée strictement au travail du lieutenant. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, are you comfortable uh, working with the Bloc Québécois for them to prop the government up? And what issues do you see your government and the Bloc Québécois having in common? Well, I'm comfortable to working with, with everybody. I mean, at the end of the day, we're elected by Canadians, be from Quebec, from Ontario, from, from different provinces. I think our, our task and our obligation is to, to improve our society, to prepare a better future for, for, for uh, Uh, younger generations, and in that sense, I'm quite confident that we're able to negotiate and get agreements with all parties, on, depending on, on the topic, and that includes definitely uh, the Bloc Québécois. Last specific question. Topics. You, were, you mentioned in, in French which specific, which specific topics you can find agreements on it, with other parties. Um, the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, I, I mean, I know the Bloc Québécois quite well. Uh, I know that this is an absolute priority for them, and I'm looking forward to sit down with them and discuss how we can, we, how we can uh, fight very aggressively uh, climate change because it's an absolutely priority. It's for all of us, but also for people from the Black Québécois. Us and the members from the Black, we're all 
the parent, parents, children, brother, sister of somebody who will care for a future, we all have that in common. Bonjour, M. Rodriguez. Uh, votre collègue, Mélanie Joly, disait un petit peu plus tôt que l'idée du ministère venait d'elle. Est-ce que c'est vous qui avez... Est-ce que vous avez fait pression auprès du premier ministre pour qu'on nomme un lieutenant québécois? Et dans un deuxième temps, étant donné qu'on ne me donne pas de questions de suivi, uh, comment réconciliez-vous le fait que, uh, comme vous avez été co-directeur de la campagne au Québec, vous avez perdu cinq sièges, et là, vous avez la promotion de lieutenant j'ai été directeur de campagne lors des deux dernières élections, donc co-président de la campagne lorsque nous avons eu les 40 sièges, lorsque nous avons maintenant eu les 35 sièges. Mais je me permettrai de vous rappeler que nous avons le plus grand nombre de sièges au Québec et aussi que nous avons eu le plus grand nombre de votes euh, au Québec. Donc, je suis fier de ce qu'on a fait. Est-ce qu'on peut faire mieux et plus? Absolument. Absolument. Et c'est ce que l'on a l'intention de faire. Vous avez des Québécois extrêmement forts autour de la table. Vous avez 10 Québécois euh, au cabinet. Vous avez un lieutenant euh, du Québec. Et vous avez une équipe qui, veut, euh, qui, qui va travailler de façon euh, euh, très dynamique, avec la main tendue. Euh, vous avez une gang de Québécois, dans le fond, qui veulent parler à d'autres Québécois pour qu'on prépare un meilleur avenir pour tous. Sur, sur, la, sur la première question, M. Rodriguez. Pablo Rodriguez, the new government house leader and Quebec lieutenant for the prime minister answering the questions there as a group of three cabinet ministers appeared before the microphone just outside Rideau Hall, where the new federal cabinet has been sworn in today. He was joined by Lawrence McCauley, who is remaining at Veterans Affairs, and Karina Gould, who is now the International Development Minister. Once again, we're watching as cabinet ministers emerge from Rideau Hall, three at a time, to answer reporters' questions. There's a new group approaching the microphone now. Coming up, we are going to have reaction from the opposition parties as well to the announcement of the new federal cabinet. Let's go now to see Bill Morneau, uh, Patty Haidu, and uh, Marc Garneau. This is Steve Shear with uh, Reuters. I had a, my first question was for Minister Garneau, and it's about um, the, the rail strike. I was wondering at what time you think the government should step in or whether it should step in to think about passing uh, back-to-work legislation, and what is your... Um, what is your view of this strike right now? What is your message? Well, uh, first of all, I'll mention that Minister Haidu, Minister of Labor, and I have been working on this. We are very seized with this uh, situation, and we are very much uh, working with the two sides, uh, CN and, uh, and the Teamsters, and we feel that uh, uh, there is a solution at hand, and we're encouraging them to continue to work together. We believe that there is a uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and we're going to push them as hard as we can because this is very important from the economy perspective. We also believe in the collective bargaining process, so we're going to uh, make sure that they know how important this is and that they have to continue working towards a solution, which, as I say, we think is within their grasp. Bien, on est certainement saisi de la situation avec les deux, euh, avec la grève euh, chez CN. Et puis, euh, on a rencontré, ministre Raidou et moi, euh, le CN et euh, aussi le syndicat des Teamsters. On les encourage fortement à trouver une solution parce qu'on pense qu'il y a une solution qui est en vue. C'est très important. On n'a pas besoin de le dire pour l'économie canadienne. Et alors, euh, on a aussi offert nos services euh, de nos médiateurs et on les pousse le plus fort possible pour qu'ils trouvent une solution. On croit dans notre parti que la négociation collective est légitime, mais on est très conscient du fait qu'il y a un impact économique qui est très important. Alors, on est en train de, de les encourager extrêmement fortement à trouver une solution et on croit que cette solution est, est, est très possible. Minister, when you say light at the end of the tunnel, you, can you say whether it's a matter of hours, days? Um, do, can you give us a... No, idea? I'm not going to give you a, a, an estimate of that. That would be, uh, that would be, uh, wouldn't be a wise thing to do. Uh, the two sides are, are talking to each other. They have a number of issues, some of, of which have been resolved, but some uh, are still sticking points. And uh, we, uh, as I say, are encouraging them to, f uh, to find a solution as quickly as possible. But I'm not going to predict... Uh, whether it's hours, days, uh, uh, that's uh, something that we hope will be as soon as possible, and we're very much monitoring it. And uh, as uh, I mentioned in French, uh, uh, mediators from the government are there to help them to reach that uh, settlement. 
Uh, hi, I have a question for Minister Haidu. Um, Minister Haidu, you played a significant part in developing Thunder Bay's uh, drug strategy. We have the opioids crisis going on. We have number of deaths going up every single year. Are there new ideas that you feel you can bring to your mandate? And if so, can you discuss any of them? Well, first of all, my heart goes out to everyone who's lost someone as a result of the opiate crisis across the country. And uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I do have a history in drug policy. And I think there are um, many great actions that our government has taken in terms of actually trying to address the crisis that's happening and unfolding all across all across Canada. I think there are uh, very good ideas. And I think that one of the things I'm looking forward to is meeting with the stakeholders that are on the ground, that are looking at solutions that will support people and families to get the kinds of uh, treatment that they need, the harm reduction services that they need, and ultimately I think so many of the actions that we've been taking as a government will also address the crisis. Things like affordable housing, for example. We don't often link those things with substance use, but in fact having a safe place to stay is a critical component of getting better. So I'm really looking forward to working with the entire team on examining this issue through a holistic lens. Just a quick, very quick follow-up on PharmaCare. That was a central plank in the Liberal campaign. Any idea on when negotiations will start with provinces and territories? Um, listen, this you're absolutely right. This is the unfinished business of, of Medicare here in Canada, and it's something that we're uh, you know, profoundly seized with. We'll be working diligently with the provinces and territories to uh, find a solution that's going to ensure that no one has to choose between medication and food. I'm looking forward to starting that work immediately. I know a lot of great work has happened already, and uh, you know, as soon as I'm able to brief up on the file, we'll be taking steps to, uh, to ensure that we, we do have a pharmacare uh, program across this country. Minister Haidu, um, you know, when it comes to the opioid crisis, uh, thousands of people are still dying. Your government has um, you know, championed uh, a number of initiatives that you know, are welcomed, but I don't think uh, anyone would say they're actually reducing the number of deaths significantly. Um, many experts say decriminalization is the way to go. Will you entertain that idea? I think that there is no one simple solution to the opiate crisis. And as I said before, I think uh, one of the things that I would like us to do as a country is look at this more holistically. I think, of course, you know, the crisis of using substances and treatment and access to a safe supply are all critical con uh, considerations when you're talking about substance use. But so are things like ensuring that every child has a fair chance at success, so that we're actually doing prevention measures as a government to prevent less people from uh, falling behind and in, in increasingly uh, experiencing, you know, mental health disorders. The challenges around mental health are significant, and I think we've oftentimes as a culture bucketed these things as separate. And so one of the things I'm especially excited to do on this file is start to bring those pieces together and look at how we have a more holistic approach to dealing with substance use, and in particular opiates. The foremost experts say that decriminalization has to be at least part of the equation. Will you entertain the idea? I think that, uh, you know, there are multiple approaches to dealing with substance use, and I'm uh, certain that as we talk to experts, there will be um, many different perspectives on how we move forward on this issue. But I will repeat, there is no one simple solution to the opiate crisis. It is intertwined with many different things that we often don't even consider as a component of problematic substance use. And so I will be talking to my colleagues, I will be talking to experts and, and researchers across the country about how we actually create a system that's going to better support families and those that are struggling with substance use. Last question. Uh, hi, Minister Haidu. Again, for you, please. Um, on uh, the assisted dying legislation, the Superior, Superior Court of Quebec ruled that it has to be um, widened, access to it has to be widened. Are you open to um, preemptive directives for people who uh, have been diagnosed with a, like a dementia? I can't speak English, I'm too cold. Do you anticipate, um, are, are you open to um, preemptive, what's it called? Anticipated, Anticipated directive, yeah, you know what I mean. I do. And or, and or are you open to um, uh, widening access to assisted dying for minors? J'ai le même problème en français comme vous. Listen, we saw the ruling, uh, respect the ruling, and we'll be looking and reviewing the legislation to see how we can respond to this. Um, we, I've heard personally very compelling stories, for example, on uh, on advance directives or advance requests for uh, medical assistance in dying. I think this is a conversation that we'll be taking very seriously at the table, as we did the first time. This is about making sure we protect vulnerable people who sometimes don't have a voice 
voice and ensuring that people aren't speaking on their behalf in a way that they wouldn't want to, while making sure that people have access to something that uh, courts have ruled is their right. And on minors, just on minors, is that something you would be open to? Again, uh, this is about reviewing uh, the, the suggestions of the court and making sure that the legislation reaches those two goals. One, protecting vulnerable people who could, uh, you know, uh, with too broad of a legislation, have um, their own safety and security uh, jeopardized. And then secondly, making sure that people do have a right to ask for assistance in dying in certain conditions. So we'll be reviewing that very closely, and it, I'm sure, will be one of my first tasks. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that question. Patty Haidu, the new Minister of Health, answering questions about the opioid crisis. Uh, preceding that, of course, there were uh, questions for Mark Garneau, the Minister of Transport. He's staying in that portfolio. He answered some questions about the CN rail strike involving about 3,200 employees of the CN and uh, didn't want to speculate as to how long it would take to resolve that. Uh, but interesting there, there were no questions for Finance Minister Bill Morneau, uh, one of the most senior ranking members of the Trudeau cabinet, and uh, the reporters didn't have questions for him. Here are François-Philippe Champagne, the new uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, along with Bernadette Jordan, who's with Fisheries and Oceans, and the new Immigration Minister, Marco Mendicino. First step I'm going to do is to go to the airport. I'm on my way to the G20 in Japan. Uh, which is taking place in the coming days, uh, making sure that Canada has a strong voice on the international stage. Uh, comme je disais, évidemment, le premier ministre aujourd'hui a uh, présenté son nouveau cabinet aux Canadiens et aux Canadiennes. Uh, dans mon cas, la première chose que je ferai, c'est de me rendre à l'aéroport pour assister à la réunion du G20 au Japon, pour s'assurer uh, que le Canada est toujours une voix forte à l'échelle internationale. Il va me faire plaisir avec mes collègues de prendre vos questions. Happy to take your questions. Prime Minister Champagne, Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Yeah. Uh, our relationship with China right now is not good. Meng Wanzhou, the two Michaels who are in jail. I'm over here. Sorry. Oh, I know, I it's tough to see us. I, I could not see you, but now I recognize your error. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, China, Meng Wanzhou issue. You've got the two Michaels in jail. You've got issues around canola, pork, beef. There's a lot of problems with China right now. What are you going to do differently than uh, Minister Freeland did to improve our relationship with China? Well, the first thing, and this is consistent with Canadian policy, um, I'm going to raise the issue of the two detainees in China, which have been arbitrarily detained in China. Um, I'm going to raise it with the Foreign Minister of China, which I expect him to attend the G20. Uh, we have been raising this issue at every single opportunity as the Canadian government, and certainly I will continue to do so uh, when I'm going to meet him in the next few days. A man who used to have your job, John Manley, said earlier this year that Canada has never been more alone in the world than we are right now. What is the biggest challenge that you think Canada is facing on the foreign affairs front? Well, I would say there's a number of priorities. I mean, there's a number of challenge, but I think as Canada, there's a number of opportunities. Uh, Canada stands in the world as a beacon of stability, predictability, and rule of law. I think this is appealing not only to people who want to come to live in Canada, but to investors. So my job uh, is going to be to make sure that we keep as many uh, relationships uh, uh, with the world. Uh, we will have a principal foreign policy, but you would appreciate that before we can comment on policy in different uh, regions of the world, I will wait until I get my first briefing uh, when we come back from Japan. Bonjour, M. Champagne, Mélanie Bonjour. Marquis de La Presse. Hier, le Canada a voté contre Israël euh, à l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies. Euh, C'est un renversement de la position traditionnelle du Canada. Faut-il voir que, y, y voir justement une nouvelle trajectoire en, matière de, en cette matière? Non, je pense que la position du Canada hier, on l'a expliqué euh, de façon claire à, à nos alliés. Euh, la position que le Canada a prise hier, c'était une position de principe. Et on va continuer, évidemment, de toujours travailler avec nos alliés dans nos votes aux Nations unies. Je pense que nos, euh, les gens de la communauté euh, juive au Canada et hors dans le monde peuvent voir le Canada comme un allié. On va continuer de le faire. Mais il y a des moments comme ceux-là où, je pense, on doit euh, exprimer euh, la position du Canada comme on a fait aux Nations unies hier. Est-ce que euh, c'est une façon pour vous de tenter d'obtenir davantage d'appui pour l'obtention d'un du, euh, siège au Conseil de sécurité? Non, le Canada, c'est un pays qui a une politique étrangère qui est basée sur des principes. Et hier, c'est exactement ces principes-là qu'on a fait valoir euh, dans notre vote euh, aux Nations unies. 
Uh, just in English uh, on that, uh, Minister Champagne, just about uh, the move to vote for that resolution of, uh, for Palestinian self-determination at the United Nations. What's the reason for that, and why do it, uh, of course, at the timing that you had done it after uh, Mr. Pompeo? Well, I think the the, uh, the vote came at this time. Uh, we expressed the position of Canada with a number of allies, but I want to say that with uh, the Jewish community in Canada, we have been in touch with a number of people in the community to explain uh, the reasons for this vote, and I think they know uh, that we are going to be working alongside always uh, in the best interest. Um, and so uh, we will continue to do that, and I think they understand very well our position but on this vote. What signal does it send about the, the future of your position? Well, I don't think you should read um, uh, our friendship with Israel is strong, will always be there and remains. Uh, but there are some times where, like yesterday, Canada to vote uh, um, with respect to its principle on this issue. And we will continue uh, to work with our colleagues. And we have worked with the community to explain the reason for that vote. Minister Champagne, uh, conversations are ongoing between Russia and Ukraine about possibly striking a deal uh, in the Donbass region. Uh, if that deal happens, will Canada join the United States and start pushing for a return uh, by Russia to the G8 or G7 or whatever number it will be? Well, I'm sure you appreciate that uh, I've been sworn in as Foreign Minister of Canada about, what, three hours ago. Um, we will certainly, um, I'll get briefings on this issue, and I think you would appreciate that this is the right course of action for me to say at this stage that um, uh, I'll wait until I get the briefing from our officials with respect to all the details about what you just mentioned. Catherine Lévesque de la Presse canadienne. Oui. Euh, C'est pas la première fois que vous succédez à Christophe Freeland, la première fois comme ministre du Commerce international, maintenant comme ministre des Affaires étrangères, mais à chaque fois, c'est elle qui a pris le dossier des relations Canada-États-Unis. Euh, comment vous sentez-vous euh, par rapport à, à ça? Qui, cette ben, écoutez, serait... moi, je pense que c'est une décision, euh, décision sage du premier ministre. Moi et Mme Freeland, on travaille ensemble depuis le début, vous l'avez dit, on le fait au niveau du commerce international. Euh, la décision du premier ministre dans ce dossier-là, c'est de mettre l'intérêt des Canadiens et des Canadiennes de l'avant. Euh, Madame Freeland, on le sait tous, comme Canadiens et Canadiennes, a établi des relations privilégiées avec nos partenaires américains. Évidemment, je vais ajouter ma voix à celle-là, mais je pense que cette décision-là euh, du premier ministre euh, permet de s'assurer. On a toujours dit qu'on travaille comme équipe Canada. Le premier ministre a dit que c'est un cabinet qui travaille ensemble. On travaille dans le meilleur intérêt des Canadiens. Et toutes les décisions qu'on va prendre, c'est de favoriser, évidemment, l'intérêt des Canadiens. Je pense que ça, c'est un bel exemple. Thank you. Merci, tout le monde. François-Philippe Champagne, the new foreign minister. Oh, he's... Is there more from Rideau Hall? Are they asking more questions? Let's listen in again. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, along with Bernadette Jordan, who is the Fisheries and Oceans Minister, and Marco Mendencino, who is the uh, new Minister of Immigration joining the Cabinet, François-Philippe Champagne answering questions about a wide range of international subjects there. At the end, you heard him talking about the fact that uh, despite the fact that he's now the foreign minister and Christy Freeland is not, that she will maintain some uh, oversight of the Canada-U.S. relationship and the negotiations around the new free trade agreement between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Next up, we are expecting Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbeau, who is one of the new faces in Cabinet from Quebec, as well Philomena Tassi, who will now be the Labour Minister and will likely be working with the Transport Minister, Marc Garneau, on a possible resolution to the CN rail strike. He referenced uh, the Labour Department in his comments earlier. And the Small Business Minister, Mary Ng, should be making, uh, all of them should be making their way to the podium shortly. But it was interesting to see François-Philippe Champagne, who has worked with Christia Freeland closely before. He is trade minister. She is foreign minister in the past when the negotiations with the United States have happened and when some of the uh, speed bumps in that relationship have been crossed by the Canadian government, uh, saying that he's willing to continue working with her in that capacity. Uh, Christia Freeland being moved out of foreign affairs and is now the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, more internally focused within Canada. But uh, the Prime Minister has said, and she alluded to the fa this fact in her news conference uh, earlier with reporters, that she will have oversight of the Canada-U.S. relationship and will continue to uh, work on the NAFTA file on NAFTA 2.0. So uh, it will be interesting to see uh, how they balance that out between Freeland 
and Champagne in the new cabinet. Christia Freeland as well has been appointed Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, so that is a new role in the Trudeau government. There hasn't been a Deputy Prime Minister since 2006. Let's go back now to Rideau Hall. Hello. Good evening. Hi, this is Steve Scher with Reuters. Uh, it's a question for Minister Tassi. Um, I was wondering if you tell us what you think about the uh, ongoing negotiations with uh, CN Rail and whether you think that uh, there's a time limit that there should be um, uh, back to work legislation at some point. Well, we're very happy that the uh, parties are at the table negotiating, and uh, we have been monitoring the situation very closely. I've spoken with both uh, Minister Garneau and Minister Haidu who have met with both parties uh, as recently as Monday, and I know uh, Minister Haidu spoke with both parties this morning. And this negotiation is very, very important. Les ministres du cabinet du gouvernement Trudeau, c'est un c'est un honneur euh, que pour pour moi euh, que, que d'être ici, que, que j'accepte avec beaucoup d'humilité. Et euh, comme l'a dit le premier ministre tout à l'heure. Euh, Toutes les voix sont, sont entendues autour de la table lorsqu'il lorsqu y a des discussions sur, sur, sur tous les sujets. Euh, le premier ministre a parlé lui-même de la question des, des changements climatiques et, et de l'environnement. Et, et je pense que euh, Patrimoine Canada, c'est une, une face. C'est un ministère où, où on est là pour faire la promotion des, des idées, des, des valeurs qui sont canadiennes. Et je pense que clairement, les valeurs environnementales, elles, elles, nous venons d'avoir une, une élection qui a beaucoup porté là-dessus. Alors, je, je, je serai heureux de collaborer avec tous mes collègues autour de la table sur, sur ces questions-là. Puis avez-vous l'impression euh, d'avoir fait les frais d'une crainte anticipée peut-être de voir l'Ouest monter aux barricades en voyant un gars d'équitaire qui a milité contre un oléoduc, qui se dit encore ouvertement contre l'oléoduc? Avez-vous l'impression d'avoir fait les frais de cette euh, crainte anticipée-là? Le premier ministre le dit tout à l'heure, la composition d'un cabinet est un exercice fort complexe avec toutes sortes de variables. Euh, moi, tout ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que je suis excessivement heureux. C'est peu connu, mais j'ai quand même écrit trois livres, dont le dernier qui portait sur l'impact du numérique sur nos sociétés et l'environnement et comment les politiques publiques peuvent servir à, à maximiser les, les bénéfices euh, de, de, des nouvelles technologies et à minimiser les effets pervers. Euh, alors, j'ai quand même un peu d'expérience dans, dans le domaine et, et je serai heureux de, de servir la la communauté artistique et, et toutes les communautés qui s'intéressent à, à ces questions-là. Um, yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah. Repeat what exactly? The, the, what, the last, the last question. Yeah, that's that was my question to your question. If you, if you could just, <laughs> do you think that you weren't named envi environment minister because it would have made the West too angry? As the Prime Minister said, uh, the, 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 not putting together a cabinet is a very complex uh, mechanic. Um, all I can say is that um, only six months ago, the idea that I would be in politics was, was just that, an idea. Uh, and now I, I, I won my nomination in Laurier Saint Marie. I'm, I'm very grateful to the voters of Laurier Saint Marie for, for giving me their confidence. Um, I, I, I won the election, and now I'm a member of, of Canada's cabinet. I'm, I'm very proud and, and humbled to, to, to be here. Um, and I, I'm going to serve uh, as Heritage Minister with the same determination, energy, and dedication that I have um, the environment for, for, for the last two decades. But what do you say to those who, who, you know, obviously they know your passion is the environment. What do you say to those who think perhaps you won't give the same attention to the Heritage file as you would have if you had been named Environment Minister? I am passionate about the environment, no doubt about it, but I am passionate about a, a number of other things. I've, I've written three books, so I, I guess I don't know if that makes me an author, but certainly someone who has written three books. Uh, the, the last one on uh, the, the, the impact of, uh, of, of technologies on our society and the environment and how public policy can help uh, maximize the benefit of those technologies and, and minimize their perverse uh, impact. So I, 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 will, I, I will be, so I will serve the, the heritage file with the same energy and determination and conviction than I have the, uh, the, the environment for, for the last 20 years. Hi, Mr. Gilbo, Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Uh, during the campaign and previously, your anti-pipeline views were very clear. Now that you're in Cabinet, Cabinet makes a number of decisions about Natural Resources Project. Uh, when you're around the Cabinet table, will you continue to uh, be against pipelines and against other Natural Resources Projects? Um, I'm. Uh, 
as a, as a member of cabinet, we will have our, our, our discussion uh, among cabinet on a whole number of, uh, of issues where, where different points of view uh, will, be, will be expressed, and we will come to, 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 to consensus, consensus views and, and make decisions to, together, to, together as, a, as a cabinet. But what views will you express? Will you continue to, to push forward those anti-pipeline views that you've clearly stated previously? I, I mean, I think that Canada, like many other countries, uh, is, is facing a very serious threat with, with climate change. The Prime Minister has talked about it many times. We are, uh, we are heading towards a, a country and a, and, a, and a world that will be a lower and lower uh, carbon-emitting uh, world. So how can we do that and ensure that we have good jobs in Canada, that, that, that we have a robust uh, economy? It will be my goal as a, as a cabinet minister, one of them. Bonjour, M. Guilbeault, Mélanie Marquis de La Presse. Euh, une fois la, la table du Conseil des ministres, comment allez-vous réussir à euh, tenir votre langue quand on va parler de projets que vous n'appuyez pas? Ben, écoutez, euh, je, on a beaucoup fait de, 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 plusieurs analogies euh, au hockey au cours des derniers jours sur euh, le, là où j'étais ou où, où je n'étais pas. Euh, alors moi, je suis un joueur d'équipe. Euh, et euh, comme on le sait très bien, euh, quand, on, quand on est dans une équipe, bien, les, les discussions se font au vestiaire. Et quand on arrive sur la glace, bien, on joue ensemble. Euh, et, et je tiens à rassurer ceux et celles. Et on a utilisé certaines analogies sur le fait que je n'étais pas dans la glace, que j'étais dans les estrades. Alors, je suis sur la glace euh, avec tous mes, co mes coéquipiers, mes coéquipières, euh, pour faire avancer le pays sur plusieurs enjeux, dont certainement celui du patrimoine, mais euh, l'enjeu du développement économique, de la classe moyenne et bien, bien sûr euh, l'enjeu. Le, de, de l'environnement et du climat. Mais que que, que dites-vous euh, à vos commettants dans Laurier-Sainte-Marie qui, euh, qui vous ont donné leur vote en euh, vous faisant confiance, en faisant confiance au fait que vous alliez défendre euh, l'environnement alors qu'en même temps, il y a des projets énergétiques euh, auxquels on donne le feu vert? Qu'est-ce que vous leur dites pour les rassurer? Comme écologiste, et, et plusieurs écologistes euh, sont du même avis, l'environnement, ce n'est pas l'affaire d'une personne euh, au sein du gouvernement. Ça doit être une priorité gouvernementale et clairement salé. Et, et moi, ce que je souhaite, c'est que les gens nous jugent non pas sur qui a été nommé où, mais sur nos actions. Euh, on, a, on a pris, dans le cadre de la dernière campagne, des engagements très ambitieux sur l'environnement en général, particulièrement sur la question climatique. Et c'est là-dessus que j'aimerais que, que, que nous soyons jugés au cours, euh, au cours des prochains mois. Question for Minister In. In uh, Jim Carr's mandate letter, a trade deal with China was uh, was listed. Will that still be a priority of the government to continue with? Well, I'm going to wait for my mandate letter, but I'm uh, really thrilled to be appointed the Minister for Small Business for Export Promotion and for International Trade, and uh, looking forward to doing the job for Canadian businesses and helping our businesses take advantage of Canada's already existing trade agreements. We're the only G7 country that has a free trade agreement with every other G7 country, helping our businesses become export ready so that they can take advantage of those customers in the international marketplace through agreements like CETA, CPTPP, uh, just to name a couple. That That, uh, that Canada has access to those international customers, and my job is to help our Canadian businesses get access to that global marketplace. Merci beaucoup. Thank Merci you. beaucoup. Thank you. Mary Ng, the minister, new minister of small business, export promotion and international trade, answering a question there at the end. We did hear earlier as well from the new minister of labor, Philomena Tassi, as expected, asked a question about the CN rail strike. But a lot of questions for Stephen Gilbeau, who's the new minister of Canadian heritage and is not the environment minister. Some people had speculated that perhaps he'd be on his way to that portfolio, but that didn't end up happening. He's a, an environmental activist. Some people have described him as anti-pipeline. So next we're going to hear from Bill Blair, who is the new public safety minister, Jean-Yves Duclos, the Treasury Board President and Seniors Minister Deb Schultz. I have no idea who you are because we, <laughs> we you are in the dark. Oh, we see so well. Hi, my name is Annie Bergeron Oliver. My question is for Minister Blair. Um, just over here, kind of tiny. We're here. There you go. There you go. Sorry, sorry Anne. All good. Don't worry about it. Your predecessor, Mr. Goodale, said that there wouldn't be a decision on Huawei until after the election. We are now after the election. And I'm wondering whether you think Canada should ban Huawei from the 5G and when Canada should make that decision. 
Well, I think there are some very complex economic and security issues that need to be addressed, and, and it will be a, a priority uh, when we come back to, to, to government and when Cabinet meets uh, to examine those issues and to make that decision. I don't have a specific timetable at this time. Minister Blair, uh, a lot of people would identify your record with, of course, the G20 protests in Toronto, with the use of carding, um, which predominantly affected uh, racial minorities in the city. Um, how will you convince people that you will be a public safety minister that does uphold the balance the Prime Minister talks about uh, between security and, and civil liberties? Well, I would simply point out that for 39 years I was responsible for in policing in the city of Toronto and for 10 as the chief of police. I've dedicated the majority of my adult life to keeping people safe and, and and I will bring that experience to my new new role but I have always remained committed to upholding the rule of law and in particular the highest law of the country the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, that is a commitment and, and a value of our government and and I, we will ensure that all of our decisions are taken through the lens of upholding uh, Canadians rights and freedoms Minister Blair, if there's no timeline for making the Huawei decision, um, so if the decision isn't made, does that mean you're still open or are you still going to be meeting with industry, with telecoms, to consider what they have to say about whether to ban Huawei? As I've indicated, there are a number of very significant economic and security de decisions. Um, I know that, that our public servants have been um, examining this issue. There are Im important matters to be considered uh, by Cabinet. It remains a priority for us, and we will deal with that um, in, in an appropriate time frame with the best information available to us to assist us in making the right decision. Including consulting with industry? Well, well, again, I'm not going to limit that consultation. We also have international partners that, that we are in discussion with as well, and so there are a number of very significant considerations that, that will be given the full attention of, of the new, new government and the new cabinet um, in making that final determination. Hi, Minister Blair Salima of GCBC. Uh, a big part of your party's platform was an, a promise to ban semi-automatic uh, assault weapons. How quickly will you be acting on that promise? Well, I, I will tell you, we, in, in consultation with people right across the country, I don't think there's a greater responsibility for any order of government, all three orders of government, uh, than, than the safety of, of their citizens. Um, we have made a commitment to strengthen gun laws in Canada. We will be working uh, very diligently in moving forward to bring uh, greater strength to, the, to those gun laws, but as well. We've also made commitments to, to make significant investment in communities and in our kids to change the social circumstances that give rise to violence, and we will work very collaboratively with, with cities and with our provincial partners right across the country, and perhaps most importantly, with communities, uh, to, in, to ensure that, that everyone has the, the resources, the support, the authorities, uh, the tools that they need to make real progress in keeping our communities safe. It is our greatest responsibility. So no timeline? So no timeline? <laughs> And, and again, it, 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 there, there is a sense of urgency. I just even uh, last week, I had a, a long conversation with Mayor Bowman in, in Winnipeg, um, who was expressing very significant concerns. And I've made a commitment to him that we will continue to work diligently with him, uh, with the province of, of Manitoba, but with all of our municipal and provincial partners across the country, with the police and with community stakeholders, to make the difference that will keep our community safe. Okay, and quickly, the BCRCMP is looking at a $10.7 million deficit, and they're not the only ones. Will you commit to an increase? in the budget uh, for the RCMP. Uh, we'll, I'll be working very closely with uh, Commissioner Lucky and, and the RCMP to make sure that the resources that are available to the RCMP are appropriately, le le appropriately deployed to enable them to do their, their decisions. Operational decisions on the deployment of those resources is ultimately that responsibility of the Commissioner, but we'll be working very closely with her um, in, in the coming weeks to ensure that all of our communities have the resources that are required to keep them safe. Hi, Mr. Blair. Uh, Mélanie Marquis from La Presse. Uh, the City of Montreal wants the federal government to uh, take measures to ban handguns and not leave it up to the cities. Are you open to the idea or you're going to stick with what was promised during the, the campaign? We've been very clear that we are intend to bring forward measures that will uh, create a more effective uh, firearm control regime in Canada. And we are prepared to work with municipalities and with our provincial partners um, in order to achieve that. As, as I've already indicated there, uh, we've heard from a number of different municipalities and stakeholders and the provinces. Um, I believe there is a, a, a real path forward and we will work very collaboratively with them uh, to deal with that as expeditiously as possible. Thank you, all. thank you very much. Merci, thank you. Thank you.
Bill Blair, the new public safety minister, answering uh, all of the questions there for that trio of members of the new liberal cabinet that was sworn in this afternoon at Rideau Hall in Ottawa. Bill Blair having replaced Ralph Goodale, who was defeated in his Saskatchewan riding in the last election. So Blair, the former Toronto police chief, now the public safety minister. The next group we are expecting at the podium includes the new Infrastructure and Communities Minister, former Environment Minister Catherine McKenna, Navdeep Baines, who is in charge of Innovation, Science and Industry, and Dan Vandal, who is the new Northern Affairs Minister. He's an MP from Winnipeg. He's Métis, and uh, he will be responsible for Northern Affairs. He's one of the few, uh, of course, uh, Western Canadians represented uh, in this cabinet, uh, one of the few from the prairies, of course. Uh, on that point, as you know, there was much talk leading up to the unveiling of the cabinet about what Justin Trudeau would do about the fact that he could not draw from any MPs, liberal MPs, in Alberta and Saskatchewan. In the note that was released by the government, there's a reference to the fact that the government of Canada represents Canadians in every part of the country and that uh, the Prime Minister has asked Jim Carr to serve as his special representative for the prairies making reference to the fact that Carr was born and raised in Winnipeg and that he will ensure that the people of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba have a strong voice in Ottawa. Carr, of course, has been undergoing treatment for cancer, but while he is not in the cabinet, will have this advisory role for the Prime Minister. Let's look at the next group of cabinet ministers now at Rideau Hall in Ottawa. Over here. We know you can't see us. Um, yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Minister uh, Baines to start. Um, so in 2016, when Lowe's uh, bought Rona, what were the warranty? Uh, well, the guarantees that were in the deal, and is Lowe's respecting those warranties? So we're going to be examining uh, their uh, conditions uh, in terms of the Investment Canada Act. Clearly, jobs, head office, these were key areas of concern for us under the Investment Canada Act. And I will continue to work with uh, my colleague, uh, Minister Fitzgibbons, in Quebec as well to determine the next steps. Are you worried the job losses that we heard about today don't respect the conditions that were in the Investment Act? Well, firstly, it's really important to note that uh, this is a difficult time uh, for the workers and for their families, and this is a concern to us and our government. And we'll continue to monitor the situation and examine uh, the information as we move forward. Uh, to make sure that uh, the covenants under the Investment Canada Act are followed on. Uh, hi, Minister McKenna. Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Hello, Mackenzie. Uh, it was well documented that there was lots of really terrible online hate and other threats that were put towards you while you were Environment Minister. Do you think that was the reason why you are no longer the Environment Minister? Uh, I served four years as a Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the first ever Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, it was a huge honour to do that. And actually, I'm really excited, uh, well, first of all, that Jonathan Wilkinson, who was my parliamentary secretary when I started in the job, uh, he was Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, now in this job, he's going to be incredible. Um, but I'm really honoured to be taking uh, on this role uh, as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities because this is really what directly matters for people. It's for, it's how we improve people's lives, it's how we get people uh, home from work, uh, get them to, you know, quickly to taking their kids to soccer. It's about clean drinking water. It's about more affordable housing. And of course, uh, it's also making sure we're building Canada for a new climate. Um, so it's an incredibly important role. Uh, I'm very excited about it. I'm excited uh, about working with premiers, um, also with mayors across the country uh, in big centres and smaller centres. Um, and of course, uh, working with the private sector, uh, we need to build Canada. We need to create good jobs and grow our economy. This is an incredibly important part of that, and we need to get projects done. Uh, you mentioned previously the impact that it's had on your family, the hate that you received and the other things like that. Did you ask the Prime Minister to be removed from the environment file to have these things stop with you? No, I would never do that. Um, I'm not going to stop doing what I believe is incredibly important. Uh, because the hate uh, I receive and many women receive, including many women journalists uh, who are right here today, uh, it's an honour to serve in Cabinet in any role. And it has been a privilege of my life to be Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, and I'm so excited about this new challenge. We have a huge opportunity uh, with the infrastructure investments that we have 
to really tra to really make a difference in the lives of Canadians and to take action on climate change. And around the cabinet table, I am not going to stop pushing for ambitious climate action that also grows the economy and, and creates good jobs. That is the most important thing that we all need to be doing. And I know it's across portfolios. I certainly saw that when I was Minister of Environment and Climate Change, how important infrastructure was uh, to building resilient communities, but also to reducing our emissions, for example, through better public transit. Um, so uh, certainly didn't stop me. Uh, and as I say, it's just an honor to serve uh, with the Prime Minister. Uh, and continue to build this great country. Just to precise, Madam McKenna, it's Marie Vassel au devoir. Um, oh, au-delà de, de l'histoire des, des trolls et de, 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 du traitement qui vous a été réservé, est-ce que vous avez demandé euh, de changer de portefeuille, de quitter le portefeuille de l'environnement? Parce que c'est ce que les gens avaient l'air de dire ouvertement, là, que vous aviez demandé ça. Donc, juste préciser. Non, je n'ai pas demandé okay. ça. J'ai toujours dit, euh, je suis heureuse de continuer comme ministre de l'Environnement et des changements climatiques. Ça fait quatre ans. Je suis, j'étais euh, le deuxième euh, ministre le plus dans le dossier le plus longtemps. Euh, mais tous les dossiers, euh, presque tous les dossiers, ont un angle sur l'environnement et des changements climatiques. Alors, je vais continuer le travail euh, au tableau, euh, mais aussi dans mon, euh, mon nouveau euh, dossier. Uh, no, I certainly didn't ask uh, to be moved as Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, I, I'm happy to serve in any role. I was the second longest serving Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and I think there's different angles that you can take on uh, how we tackle climate change, how we build a more resilient country. Uh, and infrastructure is a huge opportunity to do that. It's obviously beyond climate change, but it is about how do we get people around in cleaner ways. Um, how do we ensure that we have clean water, uh, drinking water? Uh, there are so many angles on climate change. And also, um, and we've heard this from mayors, I've heard this directly from mayors, about how do we make sure that we have resilient communities to the impacts of climate change, whether it's flooding that we've seen here impacting on people's lives, uh, or it's extremely hot temperatures, which make it very dangerous for people living in unacceptable housing conditions. So, um, But I'm going to continue working on climate change. Uh, because that is the biggest issue, and figuring out how we do in a way that grows our economy and creates good jobs. Uh, Minister Baines, I have a question about wireless prices. Anya Kadadeglia from The Wire Report. So during the election, you promised to lower wireless prices by 25 percent. And there's a number of people in the industry that say that, you know, industry has already met that goal because the numbers that you cited during the election were from 2018. So I'm wondering, do you agree with that, or do you want wireless prices to fall 25 percent from where they are today? So affordability was a very important issue during the campaign. Uh, we talked about strengthening the middle class, and one of the issues we heard often uh, from Canadians, particularly with families with multiple plans, cell phone bills, internet bills, uh, was the fact that we still pay a high price compared to our other G7 countries when it comes to internet and cell phone bills. And so we made a commitment to reduce that by 25 percent. Uh, I'm confident that uh, we can work with the telecommunication sector and, and the companies to achieve that target. Uh, as you've indicated, rightfully so, uh, prices have gone down 16% uh, last year, so clearly that's a step in the right direction. More can and will be done. And that's really a reflection of some of the actions we have taken, like a new policy directive for CRTC, which indicated that we wanted to be more consumer friendly, that we wanted to put uh, customers first and consumers first. Uh, which uh, will enable prices to go down further. Uh, we want to maintain a high-quality networks, but at affordable prices. And so we'll be coming forward with additional measures to demonstrate how we achieve that 25 percent target uh, that we articulated uh, during the campaign to really deal with that anxiety around affordability that many Canadians talked about. Last question here. Minister, uh, Minister Vandal, Janet Silver from Global News. Um, hi. Hi. Um, Given that you are cabinet minister in Manitoba, pretty big shoes to fill given yeah, Jim Carr. A yeah, um, bit of a, a dual question here in terms of um, what will you be bringing to cabinet given frustrations in the West begin at the Manitoba border? And also, what will you be doing at the cabinet table in terms of Manitoba's carbon plan? Well, first of all, I think it's important to note I'm a proud Winnipegger and a proud Manitoban first. Uh, I've been in politics for 20 years. I've represented the city, and, and I want to be a strong voice for the West, for the Midwest and for the West uh, at the Cabinet table. 
and uh, it's uh, my first foray into cabinet. I have uh, uh, um, issues in the north that I'm going to focus on. I want to get to know the file. I want to read the mandate letter, and uh, we know that uh, uh, one of the big issues in the north is climate change, amongst many, many other issues. So I'm looking forward to uh, you know meeting meeting the staff, getting briefings, and meeting the people that are on the ground, and uh, that and working with as a team on on many of those issues, uh, uh, the environment, both in the north, both in Manitoba. Uh, Churchill is a very important port in northern Manitoba. I'm expecting to uh, uh, to look at those issues a lot closer than than uh, than what I uh, in the future, and. Uh, there's certainly not a lack of issues in the north, whether it's it's the environment, whether it's transportation, energy, um, uh, food security. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually uh, uh, breathing a little bit and getting to know uh, getting to know what the challenges are at a closer level and meeting the people there. Thank, Thank you. So much. Thank, Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Well done. Dan Van Dell, who is the new Minister of Northern Affairs, a Winnipeg area MP, answering a reporter's question there. Before that, Navdeep Baines, who is the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, and the new Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, Catherine McKenna, responding to questions about whether she asked to be moved out of the environment and climate change portfolio because of all of the hateful messages that had been directed to her over the course of the last four years managing that. Uh, the government's controversial policies uh, on that file or, or uh, provocative policies, if you will. Uh, she said no, that she did not ask to be moved. She had been in that job for uh, almost as long as any other environment minister. Coming up next, we are expecting to see Marie-Claude Bibeau, who is the Agriculture and Agri-Food Minister, continuing in that role. Joyce Murray, who is now the Minister of Digital Government, and Ahmed Hussein, who is taking on the portfolio of families, children, and social development. So we expect them to begin approaching the microphone shortly. Uh, it is interesting to see uh, that there is a new face of the government's environment policies in this ministry, and that is Jonathan Wilkinson. We heard from him earlier. He's a British Columbia MP who had previously worked in the Saskatchewan government. Uh, so his connection to Saskatchewan will be one of the connections that this government will be hi highlighting in the days ahead since they don't have a Saskatchewan MP. Let's go back to Rideau Hall now. All right, we are having some audio problems. Uh, we've lost our audio connection to uh, Rideau Hall, where a series of new cabinet ministers and some continuing in their current portfolios uh, have been speaking to the media. They've been doing it in groups of three. There are 36 members of the new Justin Trudeau cabinet, and we've heard from eight groups of three already. This is the ninth right now, and it includes Ahmed Hussein, uh, who is on the left of your picture, uh, right now, speaking uh, to reporters is Marie-Claude Bibeau, who is the Agriculture and Agri-Food Minister. Hussein, as I mentioned a moment ago, is now in charge of families, children, and social development. And on the right of the picture is Joyce Murray, who is now in charge of digital government for uh, the uh, federal cabinet. So uh, we'll, we're hoping to reestablish our audio connection. Uh, just to go over some of the highlights of this cabinet, there are a number of people who are staying in the same portfolio they held before, including uh, Finance Minister Bill Morneau, David Lametti, who is the Justice Minister and Attorney General of Canada, Mark Garneau at Transport, who has already been asked some questions tonight about the CN rail strike. There are other cabinet ministers who are staying in the cabinet but moving to new jobs. As I just mentioned, Catherine McKenna, formerly the environment minister, is now in charge of infrastructure and communities. Um, have we got the audio back? No. All right. We're hoping to reconnect with Rideau Hall, where uh, there are three cabinet ministers speaking now. All right. Let's go back to Rideau Hall. We can hear what they're saying. Or other conference matters. Are you open to increasing the amount of money that you'd be giving to dairy farmers for things like CETA or CPTPP? 
We have already committed $1.75 billion for the dairy farmers, and uh, out of this amount, $345 million will be distributed this year. The producers should receive uh, the letter with uh, the, the, the procedure um, to get the money uh, up. Uh, it will be their choice to see if they want to get the first, um, the first amount of money before the end of this year or early next year. And uh, this uh, process is already ongoing, and our commitment is very strong with the dairy producers. And uh, we will see if and when we uh, finalize, ratify the NAFTA agreement, there would be an increase. And I also want to uh, finalize the agreement as well with the egg and poultry producers and the processors as well. Uh, Minister Sen, I've also got a question for you as well, sir. Uh, you're moving into a new role now, but yes. uh, you were seen as a strong performer in immigration. Uh, do you view this move to your new department as a uh, demotion, and are you disappointed to be leaving immigration? No, I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to, to be part of this uh, uh, new cabinet and, and, and to assume this role. It's a, it's a very important role that uh, combines our agenda of uh, helping the middle class, but also those who are struggling to join the middle class. Uh, issues around housing, uh, issues around uh, income security, uh, social enterprise. I, you know, I'm, I'm quite excited about the opportunity. I know firsthand the difference that the Canada Child Benefit has made uh, in in my community in Toronto. Uh, all those kids who are now out of poverty because of the Canada Child Benefit, and I, I look really forward to uh, to this new role. As far as immigration is concerned, we were able to do a lot. We reunite, we reunited more families than any other government. We were uh, we were a global leader. We are a global leader in attracting the best and the brightest to Canada. And we stood firm uh, to make sure that the most vulnerable continue to uh, get protection. So, uh, and we, while we were doing that, we also eliminated all the backlogs we inherited from the previous government. But this new role uh, is exciting. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of the aspirations of Canadians to make sure that, um, that uh, Canadians can, can aspire to a world where no Canadian can face uh, food insecurity or homelessness, and I'm very excited to work on those issues. Catherine Lévesque, La Presse canadienne. Madame Bibou, je vais vous redemander d'aller de, sur le podium. Euh, je voulais juste revenir sur les compensations et juste comprendre ce que, ce que vous nous dites. Est-ce que, euh, justement, c'est ce, ce 375 millions de dollars-là qui est en train d'être distribué? Et puis, à quand peut-on s'attendre à ce que le reste de l'argent soit distribué aux agriculteurs? Alors, l'engagement euh, qu'on a pris au mois d'août, c'est 1,75 milliard de dollars sur huit ans pour les producteurs de lait. Un premier versement de 345 millions de dollars dès cette année en versement direct aux producteurs sur la base de leur quota au 31 août. Ils vont recevoir ces jours-ci la lettre qui confirme le montant auquel ils ont droit et aussi la procédure à suivre pour pouvoir euh, obtenir l'argent. Ils auront le choix, euh, pour, pour leurs propres raisons fiscales, d'obtenir ce montant-là d'ici la fin de l'année avant le 31 décembre ou encore au début de la prochaine année, avant le 1er avril. Alors, ils vont recevoir là, dans les prochains jours euh, les détails, à la, les formalités à suivre pour obtenir le paiement. Pour la différence du 1,75 milliard de dollars, euh, on voulait procéder à, à ce premier versement-là, voir comment ça se passe, est-ce qu'il y a des choses à ajuster, est-ce que c'est la meilleure façon de, de procéder, parce qu'on avait eu auparavant des programmes d'investissement. Euh, alors, on veut être sûr que les méthodes euh, de compensation sont les meilleures. Juste pour préciser, le, ce reste de l'argent-là, quand est-ce qu'il va être distribué euh, l'année prochaine, en 2020? Bien, le 1,75 milliard de dollars, on, on dit que c'est sur huit ans, pas nécessairement en versement égaux, parce que si vous faites l'équation, vous voyez que 345 millions, c'est beaucoup plus important. Euh, dans la mesure où on va signer aussi, euh, ratifier l'entente de libre-échange avec les États-Unis et le Mexique, ce montant va être bonifié. Donc, on va rester en discussion euh, avec les représentants du secteur laitier pour voir euh, quelle est la meilleure façon, le, à l'intérieur de cet échéancier de huit ans, euh, quels sont les meilleurs mécanismes et de quelle façon on va distribuer cet argent. Okay. Juste rapidement, le Bloc québécois a demandé plus d'argent, euh, davantage de compensation. Je me demandais si vous étiez ouverte à euh, donner davantage d'argent. Le 1,75 milliard de dollars a été euh, fait suite à, à une entente avec les représentants des producteurs laitiers. C'est un montant qui est extrêmement significatif, qui, euh, qui représente, là, qui a été euh, décidé suite à un exercice euh, très approfondi avec les représentants de l'industrie. Merci.
Marie-Claude Bibeau uh, answering questions uh, in her continuing role as the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Also there, Ahmed Hussein, who is the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, and with them, uh, the new Minister of Digital Government, Joyce Murray. The next group we're expecting includes Mark Miller, who is uh, the new Minister of Indigenous Services. He's an interesting figure in the Cabinet. He worked on Justin Trudeau's election campaign in Quebec when he first ran for Parliament in the riding of Papineau, going back about 10 years now. And uh, he is a Quebec MP himself now, Mark Miller, first elected in 2015, a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces. And on June the 1st, 2017, Mark Miller delivered the first ever speech in the House of Commons in the Mohawk language. He actually took private lessons to learn Mohawk and spoke in the House of Commons in that language in 2017. So now he is the Indigenous Services Minister. He will be joined at the podium, we expect, by Carolyn Bennett, who continues in her role as Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, and also Harjit Sajjan, who is the Defence Minister, continuing in that role. There are a number of Cabinet Ministers whose jobs have not changed, Harjit Sajjan being one of them, Bill Morneau, the Finance Minister as well, David Lametti, the Justice Minister and Attorney General. One interesting thing about David Lametti, though, is that despite the fact that he wasn't changing jobs, he took a new oath of office today at the swearing-in ceremony this afternoon in Ottawa. And in that new oath of office, there was a reference to protecting and upholding the uh, role of the prosecution's office, the public prosecution's office. That had not been in there before. That was a recommendation of Anne McClellan, the former Justice Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, uh, who had been asked by the Prime Minister to look at some of the issues around uh, the role of Justice Minister and Attorney General, including whether or not to divide the two, which the government is not doing, after the resignation of Jody Wilson-Raybould. Let's go back now to Rideau Hall. Right here. Uh, hi, Tessie Sanchi, Hill Times Health. This is a question for Minister Miller. One of the promises in the Liberal platform was um, distinctions-based legislation for Indigenous health. Is that still a priority for you as you go forward? And what exactly does that mean? What do you plan to do with that legislation? Well, look, absolutely. We've. Um, you'll have to la allow me the courtesy of, of getting fully briefed at, uh, by my department. Uh, as you know, today was the day I, I, I was appointed. So. Uh, I'm glad to give you that answer in, in much more detail um, when we're not all freezing out here. Uh, but absolutely, we're absolutely committed to that. Uh, we've said so as a government, and, and, and we'll move it forward. Hi, this is from Minister Sajjan. My name is Annie Bergeron Oliver. I'm with CTV National News. In just a few weeks, there's a NATO meeting. Uh, Canada, Donald Trump will be there. And Mr. Trump has repeatedly called out Canada for not pulling its end of the bargain and spending the 2% on defense spending. There are some people that say Canada's defense industry is severely underfunded. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, um, I just want to say that it's a great privilege for me to be once again appointed to, uh, to serve the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, in 2015, uh, when we formed government, the Prime Minister gave me a mandate to, one, uh, making sure that uh, our relationship with NATO was uh, strengthened um, and the importance of our multilateralism. And through our defense policy review, uh, not our plan that we created um, uh, sees our defense spending increasing by 70 uh, percent. But spending is only one piece of it. You have to invest in the right capabilities, and our Canadian defense industry plays a, is gonna, uh, playing a very important role in this. And we've demonstrated uh, that. But with that comes contributions. And we have stepped up with NATO significantly. We have a battle group in uh, Latvia. Um, uh, we're commanding the NATO training mission in Iraq for a, uh, a second year. And that's what's needed, is nations to not only increase their spending, but have the right capability to support NATO. So we have a lot to be proud of, um, and uh, the, with the 70% increase in our defense spending. Catherine Lévesque, La Presse canadienne, pour Monsieur Miller. Euh, je, je vais peut-être juste savoir, je comprends que vous venez d'être nommé dans votre rôle, mais euh, quelle a été votre première réaction quand vous avez su que, ben, tout d'abord, M. Trudeau allait vous nommer au cabinet et que vous alliez avoir ce portfolio? Et je me demandais quelles étaient les priorités là, que, que vous voyez là, pour les services aux, aux Autochtones. Merci, Catherine. Écoutez, comme, comme tout ministre, je présume qu'il se fait nommer le privilège de servir les Canadiens. J'étais profondément ému. Euh, ça n'a pas encore rentré profondément. Euh, encore, je suis un peu euh, à y réfléchir. C'est un, euh, un dossier, c'est un portfolio. On parle de relations entre peuples qui, euh, 
qui forment notre identité en tant que Canadien. Et donc, c'est une relation qu'on se doit de réussir euh, coûte que coûte. Ce n'est pas un dossier dans lequel on peut rentrer puis ensuite sortir. Euh, ça prend un effort soutenu. Euh, ça prend une passion euh, pour, pour ces enjeux. Et, et, et quand on parle de services euh, aux Autochtones en particulier, on parle des avis, des bulles du d'eau qui ne sont pas complétés encore. Euh, aucun Canadien, aucune personne euh, sur cette terre ne devrait aller sans avoir d'eau potable, vous le savez très bien. Euh, ces enjeux continueront. Nous venons de faire, euh, de faire l'investissement le plus profond euh, de tout gouvernement confondu dans l'histoire du Canada. Euh, les preuves sont à l'appui, mais il reste beaucoup de travail à faire et à accomplir euh, dans le volet service et aussi dans le volet que Mme Bennett euh, chapeau, dont les, la relation avec les peuples autochtones. Et donc, euh, travail assidu, euh, travail, travail de fond, euh, pas nécessairement devant les caméras ou sur Twitter, mais c'est quelque chose euh, que l'on se doit de réussir pour euh, tout particulièrement cette relation entre nos peuples. Hi, Christy Kirkup with the Globe and Mail. Um, Mr. Miller, I'll just get you to repeat in English, uh, if that's okay, um, just kind of your priority for the file. And then also some people uh, know you from specifically in 2017 uh, when you made history, when you uh, delivered uh, the first speech in Mohawk in the House of Commons. Um, and if you could just tell us a bit about why you decided to, to learn Mohawk and how this speaks to your commitment to, to reconciliation. Oh, wow. Well, um Ah, So I'll translate <laughs> for the benefit of all of you. Um, I'm very happy you asked that question. Uh, it, it is, um, I've been studying um, about an hour a day uh, in Mohawk, uh, but it is not an easy language. That's essentially what I said. Um, It's something I kind of fell into. Uh, I did it, uh, and it's you documented it in the past. I, I, I've done it. I did it because I wanted to show solidarity to my friends who were working on, on perfecting their French, and I thought, oh, how hard could it be? Um, it's extremely hard, uh, and I was extremely naive when I got into it. Um, but I fell into a world that I don't know, and I've had um, the privilege of having a window into it open to me. It has allowed me... I should have known it. Uh, I'm from Quebec, and uh, language is at the core of our identity as Quebecers and the fight to preserve that language. Um, but I didn't see the same with Indigenous languages. And I fell into this world um, through naivete and, and, and through a lot of luck. And through that, I've met a lot of people that are passionate about their language, passionate about their identity, passionate about their people. They aren't necessarily elected officials, but they are people that I meet in communities. And they are fighting um, the effects of colonialism, residential schools. Uh, and I've had that privilege window opened onto me, and it can be shut quite quickly. Uh, I'm an outsider into those communities, um, and I'm very privileged to experience that. And this is not, as I said, so I'll translate what I said in, from French earlier on. Um, it's not something, it's not a portfolio that you can jump in and jump out of. You can ask the former ministers that have served, they still feel very much part of it. Um, if you look at the work that Minister Bennett has done, she has worked on it her whole life. Uh, and there's a lot much more to do. Uh, we owe it to ourselves as Canadians to get this relationship right. It is an exceedingly complex one, uh, but it defines us as, as a nation. It defines us as a people, and uh, it's not something that's going to be done on Twitter. It's not going to be something that's going to be done on cameras. It's something that's going to be done with hard work in the background, and it's also an area where your political instincts, frankly, fail you sometimes. Uh, we, we, we sometimes, as elected officials, think in four-year increments. Uh, we sometimes, as elected officials, want to brag every time we make um, the historic investments that we've talked about. Um, but a lot of those investments are, are us making up for court decisions, making up for uh, promises that we've broken. And you can't run around um, claiming victory on those things. You have to quietly move forward and improve that relationship. I think with working with Carolyn uh, and working with the other ministers, including Harge, that have that portfolio as well in certain aspects of defense, um, whether you talk about the Campion barracks or otherwise, 
these are things that, uh, that, will, that, that will go on past this government, but what we need to do in our departments is, is, is get our houses in order so that the next person that takes over from me, from Carolyn, from Harge, um, will have all, all, all the keys to success and victory to move this relationship between peoples forward. Uh, yes, it's between politicians and elected officials. We need to do our part, but we won't get this right if it is not accomplished through people. And just uh, to, to Minister Bennett, um, I'm, I'm wondering, obviously you bring a lot of experience uh, to the portfolio that Mr. Miller just mentioned. Um, how do you think that that uh, can offer the, the Prime Minister and the government uh, stability as, um, you know, you've worked on relationships in Indigenous communities uh, for the last decade in particular? Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just so proud to be here with uh, Mark Miller, it, uh, it, it was very emotional, um, even having him say the word autochton. Um, it is, um, it is a, a life's work that people can't pick up and put down, as Mark said, and so it is about building trust. Uh, I think we used to say rebuilding trust. I don't think there could have ever been trust in that, in that, in that the colonial policies were based on a lot of lies. And so for us to to be able to move forward in those relationships that were in the mandate letter of every minister last time, uh, recognition of rights, respect, cooperation and partnership, that, that that has to be across the whole of government. And I think that's what, that's why working with Minister Sajjan, you know, on April Wash or on Campion Barracks, on the the, um, the the various areas where where his department, who probably wasn't sure that they had anything to do with our file at the beginning, um, that that we've been able to move this in in uh, across uh, whole of government because the Prime Minister did really put it into the mandate letters of every single minister, and so I think that's. Uh, um, what we're going to continue to do, I think that in distinctions based in terms of understanding uh, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, uh, the, the fact that we have to work with our partners on their priorities, that they get to set the agenda of the things that matter most to their people, and that we will, uh, we will continue to put one foot in front of the other and, uh, and, and give it our very best efforts uh, to be able to see the kind of significant progress that, that we'll never be able to be rolled back. Um, this is about the first peoples of this land and their rights, uh, and uh, we we want to be able to to uh, um, have earned um, that trust uh, that has been so missing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Bennett, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, and before that, Mark Miller, who is the newly appointed Minister of Indigenous Services. And as he alluded to, he uh, gave a speech in the House of Commons two years ago in Mohawk. Uh, he spoke of himself as an outsider. He talked about the important learning that he needed to do in this role, and both he and Bennett talked broadly about some of the steps that need to be taken to uh, improve trust and build the relationship between the federal government and Canada's Indigenous communities. Also, Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan, part of that group. If you're just joining us, the new cabinet has been sworn in, and three cabinet members at a time are approaching a podium outside Rideau Hall in Ottawa, where the swearing-in ceremony took place, and answering questions from the media. So far, we've heard from 10 of those groups, 30 members of the cabinet. There are 36 members of the new federal cabinet. So we're expecting within a few moments so that we will see Dominic LeBlanc, who has been undergoing, of course, treatment for cancer uh, recently. Uh, he's been, uh, tre been treated for that uh, for some time now. He remains in the federal cabinet as the uh, president of the Queen's Privy Council. It's kind of a minister without portfolio role that allows him to continue to serve in the cabinet. Uh, he is a close confidant of the Prime Minister, and uh, he appeared at the swearing-in ceremony today uh, wearing a mask over his mouth uh, to protect him. His immune system obviously uh, compromised by the treatment that he's receiving. Uh, he took the mask off when he was sworn into his role, but put it back on uh, as he returned to his seat in the uh, tent room at Rideau Hall where the swearing-in ceremony took place. 
Along with Dominic LeBlanc, we expect that the Justice Minister and Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti, will appear in the next group of Cabinet Ministers and Employment Minister Carla Qualtro. And uh, David Lametti, I'm sure, will get lots of questions about his role. He, of course, succeeded Jody Wilson-Raybould in that role. And the role of Justice Minister and Attorney General remains uh, one role, when one cabinet minister serving in that capacity. There had been talk at one point of it being split up. Uh, but Anne McClellan, who is a former Justice Minister herself uh, and a former Deputy Prime Minister, uh, recommended to Prime Minister Trudeau that uh, the roles did not have to be split up, did not have to be separated, so it doesn't appear as though that is going to happen anytime soon. What did happen today, though, that was noteworthy is that while many cabinet ministers who were remaining in their current portfolios, people like Bill Morneau at Finance, Harjit Sajjan, who we just saw, who remains the Defence Minister, they were presented to the Governor-General, but they did not uh, take an oath again. They were not sworn into their roles again because they are simply continuing in the same capacity. Uh, David Lamenti did take a new oath, and that's because uh, the oath was modified to include a reference to the Public Prosecution's Office to uh, include the fact that the Attorney General of Canada is a defender of that process effectively. So uh, that was part of the oath that David Lametti took and that was the reason why he took an oath today rather than just uh, continuing in the current role. All right, here are some more cabinet ministers making their way. It's a group of five actually who are making their way now including David Lametti, uh, Mariam Monsef, uh, this is going to be everyone, Mona Fortier, Seamus O'Regan, and Carla Qualtro. So Dominic LeBlanc will not be there, understandably, because of his condition. Let's go back to Rideau Hall. Uh, Minister O'Regan, Mackenzie Gray from CTV News. Um, you are quite literally the person who is the furthest away from Alberta, yet you've been appointed as a natural resources minister. Why should Albertans and other Western Canadians trust you to be the person who is in charge of the natural resources? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, Firstly, Newfoundland and Labrador is the third largest oil and gas uh, supplier in the country. And most of my constituents are in some way or another affected by the industry. Um, and they made their concerns very clear to me. Um, I respect where a lot of Albertans and uh, a lot of people out west are. I, I understand where their heads are right now. And all I can say is, you know, I will make my case. Um, that outside of the line items that I've had to deal with, the direct responsibilities of the two ministries I've held previously, my number one priority has been oil and gas in Newfoundland and Labrador. And top of that list is providing a stable environment for investment um, and, and, and making sure that uh, investment doesn't run away from an industry that is very much in transition. And we know that. And, um, and I'm you know, proud of the fact that we've been able to do some very good work with the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, and even more importantly, proud of the fact that we've been able to do some very good work with industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. Newfoundland and Labrador is actually more dependent on oil and gas royalties than Alberta is. So I have no choice to make sure it's my top priority. And I am very proud of the industry that we have out our way. Um, but I understand it is not the same industry. Um, ours is offshore. Uh, I'm reminded every day that uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador we get Brent crude prices, which today uh, are still about double what Alberta gets for its. Um, and uh, and that, you know, that's a very real concern. I share that concern, I should tell you too, uh, with the Alberta, Alberta Energy Minister. Minister Savage and I were just on the phone about 20 minutes ago, and I'll be heading out uh, to meet with her tomorrow evening. Um, and to, to get out to Calgary and in what will be many trips to Alberta and Saskatchewan, as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have been doing now for about 30, 40 years, if not longer. Uh, you know, we are very proud of the number of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that have helped build a great and proud industry in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. And we have to figure out, in a time when many Canadians are concerned with climate change, how we ensure their prosperity and their stability while at the same time meeting the concerns surrounding this transition. Mr. Lametti, I've got a question for you as well, sir. Uh, since the SNC-Lavalin affair, the SNC-Lavalin stock has been in the tank, but the day after the Liberal government, your government got re-elected, it went up 12% largely because investors thought that your government would give a deferred prosecution agreement to SNC. Are you planning to give a DPA to SNC? 
I've, I've been asked that question a number of different times. Uh, a, a DPA is a legitimate legal option, but I will not uh, pronounce one way or another because there are two pieces of ongoing litigation uh, that involve SNC on that, on that very point. Uh, and so I won't pronounce uh, in any way, shape or form because I don't want to have any kind of impact uh, on that litigation. Uh, comme j'ai dit à plusieurs reprises, j'ai répondu à vos questions à plusieurs reprises. Euh, vous qu'il y a deux procès actuellement devant les tribunaux, euh, je ne vais pas me prononcer euh, sur un accord de réparation pour SNC parce que je ne peux pas, en tant que procureur général du Canada, avoir un impact euh, sur euh, le, le litige. Uh, Salima Shiv, GCBC News, uh, Minister, we're going to a question for you again uh, on Alberta natural resources. Uh, there's so much anger and frustration there. I, I just want to know what can you possibly say as a Newfoundlander to to let them know that you are actually listening? What what what? How can you possibly even broach it and and reassure them that you can a are actually listening to that anger and frustration? I think the most important thing that you say right off the bat is that you're listening, um, and that, you know, but. But you have to act, and we have to figure out how we do that together. And look, I, we have a great natural resources industry in this country. We have a great oil and gas industry in this country um, that is is capable of adjusting to to, to, to di very different times. That I think, with ingenuity and with hard work, and I think very importantly with collaboration, we can meet the challenges of the day as we have before in the past. And all I can say is, is you know, the people that I represent, my constituents, are oil and gas workers. Uh, it is uh, some of them work in Alberta. The, in Alberta, many of them um, work in Newfoundland and Labrador. And we have a, a very proud industry there um, that I have been proud to represent at the cabinet table uh, for two years now, and I will continue to do that. Um, but more importantly, I think with the responsibilities that we have now. I think Albertans and, 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 you know, and people in Saskatchewan, people who are involved in the oil and gas industry right across the country need to know that we heard them. We heard them. And, uh, and while I may not be Albertan, or I may not be from Saskatchewan, uh, I am from an oil producing province. And I represent people in the industry. And I will continue to represent them. And I will, I will represent this industry and its workers at the, ta at the, at the cabinet table. I've got a question from Minister Montef. Anya Kedeglia from The Wire Report. So you're going to be taking on, in addition to your previous responsibilities, rural economic development, and the issue of rural broadband falls under that purview. I'm wondering what your plan is to tackle that issue, and I'm wondering how you're going to make sure that it doesn't fall through the cracks, given your other responsibilities. Thank you for that question. It's a privilege to be back on this traditional Algonquin territory to represent the people of Peterborough Kawartha, a mixed rural urban riding. Uh, and I'm grateful to the Prime Minister for, for allowing me to continue the work as the Minister for Women and Gender Equality, in addition to responsibilities for the Minister of Rural Economic Development. Absolutely, connectivity is a significant priority for our government, ensuring that rural Canadians' needs, their economic opportunities, as well as their social needs are taken into account, uh, is going to be a priority for me. Uh, we've done a really good job, and more than any other government in our past, we've been able to advance equality by ensuring that every federal department is working to advance equality in Canada and around the world. We need to do the same for rural Canada so that what works on Bay Street also works on Main Street. Uh, Justin Ling, Freelance. Uh, Minister Lametti, uh, your party once promised to remove or reduce mandatory minimum sentencing and to do a review of the criminal code to reduce the prison population. You've just concluded a cons consultation on that I know that was not super clear about which direction you're heading. Um, can you commit to, to how you intend to go forward on any sort of uh, justice reform? Well, we're all waiting. Uh, obviously, as, as Minister of Justice, I have an ongoing responsibility to continue uh, to uh, watch uh, and uh, the, the criminal justice system and see how it works. Uh, we've just, as you know, we passed Bill C-75 uh, late in our mandate, so, so one of the priorities is seeing how that uh, plays out uh, and whether um, the changes that we made are having the, the, the desired impacts. Uh, with respect to mandatory minimums, um, that is a piece of unfinished business. Uh, a number of us have, have uh, said that uh, moving forward, uh, but as of yet, uh, I don't uh, 
I will wait for the mandate letter. Uh, I will wait uh, f to see the results of, of those consultations, and I will continue to uh, I will continue uh, to engage uh, with uh, experts and stakeholders uh, in terms of how to how to address that issue. But you have the results of those consultations. I mean, are you saying that you're you're not decided about whether or not you remove mandatory minimums? And just really quickly, you also pledged to review the law around sex work, uh, though that appears to be up in the air. Are either of those well, things coming for sure? Again, uh, just been uh, we we have been uh, looking at both of those issues, uh, but as I said, we're we're going to uh, wait for the mandate letters to come down. Uh, we're going to now we now have a, a, a cabinet uh, that I can go to, uh, that I can speak with, and that I can consult with, uh, as well as what we have uh, from from experts and stakeholders, and we'll continue uh, to see uh, how uh, all of this uh, is working on the ground and what is possible given. Uh, the legislative agenda that we will have and what other what the other parties because uh, we're going to have to work in a minority government situation with other political parties and we're going to see uh, what their priorities are with respect to, to criminal justice reform. Uh, Janet Silver Global News this is a question from Minister O'Regan. Um, earlier the uh, production gap report came out and basically says that the government's uh, current plan to increase oil sands production there's no way we're going to hit the uh, Paris Climate Accord Agreement. So I guess what I'm wondering is, does the government concede that our current fossil fuel production means we can't hit those targets? And will we look at reducing subsidy, subsidies for f fossil fuel production? Uh, I would have to say I've been in this job for a couple of hours. I'm going to wait until the department briefs me on that. I mean, what, 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 in terms of overriding what we're trying to get right here, and it's difficult to do, I, you know, but I'm accepting the challenge here, is trying to make sure that we have an industry that is thriving, that people realize is stable, that the people who work in it have stable incomes and can look forward to stable futures. It has provided an enormous amount of prosperity to this country. How do we square that with our international commitments and to you know, an overriding concern of Canadians from all parts of the country that something we need to do something on climate change. Uh, you know, we, we have attempted to find the middle ground on that because that is where we need to be, because that is where most Canadians are, and we need all Canadians, as many as possible, on board in order to make a shift. Um, but, uh, you know, that uh, what you're hitting on there is, is very much at the center of that, and, uh, and that will be the challenge of my ministry, and indeed it will be the challenge of the entire government. Hi, it's Annie Bergeron Oliver with CTV National News. My question is actually for Minister Qualtro. Probably should have said that first. Thank you. Uh, we heard from a lot of Canadians during the campaign who felt like the community of people with disabilities were really largely being ignored, that people weren't listening to them, that the parties were not talking about how to make life better and talking about their needs. I know you passed the Accessible Canada Act before the election. I'm wondering what your priorities are going to be now in this file. Well, I was very excited, Annie, when um, during uh, the election, our party released what we call the Disability Equality Statement, which is, in fact, the first time ever a party or uh, a government has ever committed to disability equality along the same lines of gender equality. And we said in that uh, statement we would do a number of things to ensure that uh, people with disabilities are a priority for our government. And even the change, the, the change in my title from Minister of Accessibility to Minister of Disability Inclusion is quite a signal for the community. It's where the UN is going. And it uh, obligates governments and uh, political parties to think inclusively about their citizens with disabilities. So I actually think we did. Uh, maybe it wasn't talked about as, as much as some of us would have liked, of course, but I think um, I'm extremely proud of our disability equality statement and look forward to implementing it. That means putting a disability lens on government policies and programs. It means thinking about national employment strategy for citizens with disabilities. It gives us a lot to do, but there is a lot to do. Thank you. Bonjour, ma question est pour Monsieur Lametti, Catherine Lévesque, La Presse canadienne. Juste rapidement, je voulais savoir sur l'aide médicale à mourir. Vous allez devoir réviser la loi bientôt. Je me demandais où vous étiez prêt à aller euh, là-dessus. Nous avons une, une décision de la Cour supérieure euh, au Québec. Euh, donc, c'est un point de départ. Euh, nous avons l'étude qui a été faite euh, pour préparer pour la, pour, euh, la revue de la loi euh, dans deux ans. Il faut euh, évidemment... Euh, Il faut s'asseoir euh, avec euh, les personnes intéressées, euh, les experts, euh, la, la communauté euh, 
les communautés affectées euh, par la loi. Et donc, euh, et on va voir ce que le, ce que le Québec euh, va faire, parce qu'évidemment, on va, on va travailler avec le Québec parce qu'ils sont dans la même situation. Nous avons six mois. Et, euh, et donc, le processus a été déjà euh, enclenché après la décision euh, et nous allons trouver un consensus avec, euh, avec euh, les autres parties euh, autour de la table, euh, ici à Ottawa et, et au Québec et, euh, et à travers le Canada. Et on va, on va s'assurer qu'on va, qu va trouver euh, le moyen, euh, le juste moyen exigé euh, par la décision de la Cour supérieure euh, du Québec. Uh, J'avais aussi une question pour Mr. O'Regan. Do you speak French at all? Or no. Not really? Okay. Well, <laughs> I just wanted to know as Natural Resources Minister how you're going to pull your weight at the cabinet table when you have, let's say, Stephen Gilbo, who's publicly opposed to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, when you have the Environment Minister, when you have all these people who are very committed to climate change. I think you have a, a group of people that are also very committed to the middle class and those working hard to join it. And, uh, uh, extremely committed. Look, you know, it, it, this doesn't play well, but this is a, an extremely, and this is a nuanced argument. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you people will scream one side or scream the other, and I think we as a government have a responsibility to find that that muddled middle. But it is it is extremely important that we get this balance right. You know, as I said before, I mean, these people. Oil and gas workers, people involved in the industry, people who are affected or serve the industry, are my constituents. This is what I hear at the doors all the time. Uh, and as a, as a cabinet minister uh, from an oil producing, gas producing province, uh, trust me that my cabinet colleagues have heard my voice and my opinion firmly and resolutely around that cabinet table before. This is also for Minister O'Regan, Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Minister, you've um, found yourself putting your foot in your mouth a few times in previous files. Now you're having one of the most sensitive files that the government has. How are you going to avoid fanning the flames of controversy? I, I will continue to speak my mind, and uh, sometimes there are repercussions to that. Um, I will continue to speak loudly and speak my mind on things. Uh, you know, obviously, in a, in a, in a position such as ours, yeah, you, had, you do have to be very careful, and sometimes you have to be taken out of context. But, you know, in, in this day and age, particularly with social media, it is so easy to be taken out of context, and things can uh, that things like that can happen so easily that you could be stifled from any sort of meaningful conversation uh, and an honest discourse with with people that you represent and, and Canadians. And frankly, I'm I'm not doing that. Um, you know, I I might I'll probably be taken out of context again. I'm sure. And that's the price I'll pay. But I think that the issues that I'll be dealing with as Minister of Natural Resources, it is pivotal that we are honest and upfront with people, and that we talk about striking that you know that that pivotal balance um, between a, a proud industry trying to attempting to find its way uh, in a in a globe where our circumstances are changing and where Canadians' concerns are also are, are changing somewhat. And and that is not always going to be easy. And I think people need straight talk. My question is for Minister Fortier, uh, Taylor Blewett from the Ottawa Citizen. Why do you think Canada needs a uh, Minister of Middle Class Prosperity? Well, I've had the privilege in the last year of traveling and uh, talking with Canadian stakeholders, and the central theme was how are we going to continue to grow our economy and grow the middle class? So one of my, my uh, mandate will be to make sure that we find those measures and work with Cabinet to uh, make our middle class stronger. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Go get some hot chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> That's the final group of cabinet ministers, five of them uh, in a series of news conferences, uh, question and answer sessions with the uh, national, uh, with the uh, parliamentary press gallery that uh, has taken about the last two hours since it began with Christia Freeland leading a group of cabinet ministers out to the microphone. Uh, in that last group, we saw Seamus O'Regan, who is the newly appointed Minister of Natura, uh, National, Natural Resources, uh, answering questions about how he would manage that portfolio, uh, particularly given that he is from Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, which, as he has pointed out, is an oil-producing province, but he's not from Alberta or Saskatchewan, which had concerns about the federal government's commitment to resource production. 
Uh, also in that group, Mona Fortier, an Ottawa area MP who has been appointed Minister for Middle Class Prosperity and also the uh, Associate Minister of Finance. Carla Qualtro, who uh, has the role of employment and also uh, inclusion. Uh, also in that group was Maryam Monsef, who is in charge of the portfolio uh, covering women, gender equity, and uh, rural development. Uh, Dominic LeBlanc was not there. He is the president of the Queen's Privy Council, effectively a minister without portfolio. Uh, he, of course, has been for the last two years undergoing treatment for a form of leukemia. Uh, he was at the swearing-in ceremony, uh, but was not there for uh, the Prime Minister's uh, question and answer session with the media, nor did he join the others in these uh, uh, media availabilities following the swearing in. So we heard from 35 of the 36 cabinet ministers over the course of the last couple of hours. David Lametti, the Justice Minister and Attorney General, was part of that last group of five as well. This has been a big day in Ottawa, a new cabinet unveiled. Many people staying in their current portfolios, including Bill Morneau, the finance minister, David Lametti, who I just mentioned is the justice minister and attorney general, Harjit Sajjan at defense, Mark Garneau at transport. There are seven new faces in the cabinet and there are a number of changes, people who have moved from one portfolio to another. Among those uh, notable moves, Catherine McKenna is no longer the Minister for Environment and Climate Change. She's now in charge of infrastructure and communities. Her replacement at Environment and Climate Change is Jonathan Wilkinson, the British Columbia MP who had previously worked in the Saskatchewan government. There has been a lot of reaction from Ottawa and beyond today. So in a moment, we'll let you hear what NDP leader Jagmeet Singh had to say about the swearing in of the new cabinet today. But let's hear first from the Conservatives, represented by Quebec MP Gérard Deltel.